we need to figure out how to eat. We need to figure out how to become our own nutritionist. This isn't rocket science. You know, the only people that have made food complicated in the last 50 or so years have been the food scientists themselves. Hi everyone, Drew Prote here, host of the Broken Rain Podcast. Today we're talking with Vani Hari, the food babe, about food advocacy and her new cookbook, The Food Babe Kitchen. Vani shares a whole bunch of stories with us on today's podcast about how she got big companies to completely change their ingredients around, or in some cases, even reveal what was previously hidden inside of their ingredients. How does one person do this? Well, she's going to be talking about that. She's also going to be talking about making healthy cake for your kid. How is that possible? And some of her favorite recipes from her new cookbook. It's a fun conversation. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast, where we dive deep into the topics of neuroplasticity, epigenetics, mindfulness, mindset, functional medicine, and yes, even food. And that's exactly what we're talking about today with my dear friend, Vani Hari. Vani Hari was named as one of the most influential people on the internet by Time Magazine. She is a revolutionary food activist behind foodbabe.com, the famous website, many of you know it co-founder of the organic food brand Truvani, New York Times bestselling author of The Food Babe Way and Feeding You Lies, and soon to be Food Babe Kitchen, putting it out there in the universe. She's led campaigns against food giants like Kraft, Starbucks, Chick-fil-A, Subway, General Mills, and many, many more. Campaigns that have attracted more than 500,000 signatures and led to the removal of several controversial ingredients used by these companies. Her drive to change the food system inspired the creation of her new company, Trivani, where she produces real food without added chemical, chemicals, products without toxins, and labels without lies. Vani has been profiled in the New York Times, the Atlantic, and has appeared on Good Morning America, CBS, CNN, Dr. Oz Show, Doctors, on and on and on. She lives in Charlotte, North Carolina with her husband and her daughter, Harley, and another baby on the way. Vani, welcome back to the Broken Brain Podcast. And again, congratulations, baby number two on the way, new book. That's another baby on its own. Uh, it's <laughs> exciting time to have you back. Well, thank you so much, Drew. It's so good to be back. Um, you know, we have, we have so much to catch up on, and uh, this has been an exciting time for me, and thank goodness I've been, um, this, this new book, Food Babe Kitchen, couldn't have come at a better time, because when I was recipe testing and, and getting into the nitty-gritty to making sure every I was dotted and T was crossed in this book, we were in the midst of a pandemic where we were all locked down and a lot of us are still locked down. And um, thankfully um, a lot of people had to resort back to their kitchens. And um, I just think this book is, is just a beautiful um, uh, timing um, with this book for it to come out now, because I think people are realizing that um, making food in their own kitchen is so important. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful for the universe for giving me this time to make this book as perfect as, as, I, as I can make it. Yeah, um, you know, it, just, to, just to jump in, people have been returning to their kitchen in some ways that are helpful, some ways that are hurtful, <laughs> right? Like the stats on like alcohol sales were way up during the pandemic and quarantine, sugar, comfort food. But I think as much as we can look at that and see something bad, what people are looking for in these times is there is this urge. And obviously through your education, our education, we're trying to steer people towards the healthier options, the healthier foods that are there. There is this urge to get back to actually slowing down, back to actually making food. It's just that sometimes people don't know exactly the best way to go and step back into that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I was growing up, I grew up with two immigrant Indian parents that kept me out of the kitchen. They, they cared about two things, math and science. They wanted me to study. And, you know, you have Indian parents. <laughs> you know how they can be with your studies. And so, you know, I didn't learn how to cook. I had to teach myself from scratch. And it was when I went through a big health awakening after being on several prescription drugs really sick as a child. And then in, as an adult, when I was working in the consulting world, 
in this rat race environment, um, on an expense account, eating all these lavish meals and everything being catered in so that you could work as many hours as you could and bill them to the client. I was in this environment where, you know, I was outsourcing my food to my work because I wanted to obviously excel and do well. Um, and I found myself overweight, sick, and walking around like a zombie, and then in the hospital. And that was my wake-up call when I eventually landed in the hospital with an emergency appendectomy. And at the time, they say, you know, your appendix, you don't need your appendix. It's, it can just, you know, it's something that, you know, just happens randomly to you. But it's, you know, an, it's something, a spare part, like a leftover Ikea screw or something. Right. Like, you know, God didn't intend that at all for you. Well, uh, what they found today in modern science is actually the appendix actually feeds your gut with good bacteria. Um, that also affects your brain, you know, being on the broken brain podcast. Yeah, it's, a, so. it, it's a reserve. It's a reserve for your gut. We lit our, ba- our body literally is storing a reserve of bacteria in there in case of who knows what happens. Yeah. And, you know, mine became very inflamed because of the way that I was treating it <laughs> with the, the diet that I was on. And, um, and something just didn't seem right after I went through that experience and I decided to make changes and I started to channel all this energy that I learned in high school where I was number one in state three years in a row for debate and I was recruited to college to be in debate and one year's topic was healthcare and I was using all my knowledge to go and research at the library back then. We didn't have Google, so you had to go through the microfiche and these law journals and print out all this information and take them in big tubs of evidence to different debate tournaments. And so I learned all about the healthcare system and how screwed up it was, but I wasn't using that information towards my own health in high school because, you know, you're just a kid. You just, you're, you know, you're using it to win debate rounds or whatever. And, um, but then I just started to remember all that information that I'd learned. And so I I just went to the library and started checking out big books on nutrition and teaching myself to become my own nutritionist uh, on how to heal my body. And, And that's really when I discovered organic living, organic food, and then got off every single prescription drugs and started to see major changes in my body. Um, the weight fell off naturally, never had to diet. My skin cleared up. Um, you know, my asthma didn't come back. Uh, I didn't I have stomach issues all the time. I mean, it was dramatic. And people around me, everyone, my friends, my family, my coworkers saw these changes happening. And they're like, you know, we want some of what you're having. <laughs> you know, what are you doing over there? Um, and yeah. uh, just, just to jump in, I was listening to the first part of the interview that you did with Mark, which I think is coming out this, this week or next week. Um, and you were saying that the first book that you came across in the library that really kind of opened up your eyes was Gabriel Cousins, who came from like the raw food movement and kind of like the, the, the vegan movement. But the central message that he had in his books that you picked up on, which is most of the food that's in the grocery stores is actually not living. It's completely dead. Yep. It's completely dead. And that just, that just hit me like a brick. And I was like, wait a minute, what have I been eating? All this dead food, no wonder I felt dead. And, um, and thank goodness for that, but I actually still have it right here today. And it's something that I, I reference, even though I'm not a raw foodist, but <laughs> the principles in that book are so profound and I actually make probably 50% of my food raw at least every single day that is unadulterated by the food industry, by chemicals, um, stuff I grow either in my yard or I pick from the farmer's market that I'm, you know, eating every single day. And that's how my daughter eats and my, my husband eats. And those are the principles in Food Babe Kitchen. And, um, and so, you know, I finally changed my life. And, you know, being a girl in this corporate environment, living in Charlotte, North Carolina at the time, I mean, this is over 15 years ago. And, this is a time period where we didn't have a whole foods here. There wasn't this big food revolution happening. There wasn't this big push for organics. Costco hadn't seen an organic product, you know, um, uh, organics was not available at a regular grocery store. You had to go to a, a specific like natural food store in order to find anything like that or find the brands that are eliminating a lot of the controversial chemicals in our food. And, 
it, it was a tough road to figure this out um, without the resources of living in a big city um, that had access to this kind of stuff. And so I, I think that's one of the reasons why I've been so successful teaching my uh, lifestyle through Food Babe and through my investigations to other people because I had to do it the hard way. You know, I didn't have it easy. And it's also made um, me creating my book, Food Babe Kitchen, so much more important because I constantly see people make, uh, unfortunately, big mistakes in the kitchen on whether they're warming up their food wrong or they're using the wrong pan or they have the wrong ingredients stocked in their kitchen. And so I made the first 55 pages of Food Babe Kitchen solely on how to create a food babe kitchen, how to, how to you know, stock your, your pantry with the best ingredients, how to go through every single grocery aisle and look for the best version of eggs or milk or um, butter or whatever, you know, whatever staple you're buying, rice, you know, oats, etc. cetera. Um, and then how to do a pantry purge of removing products that have a list of no-no chemicals that are very controversial. I mean, you know, the chemicals that have been invented to put into processed foods over the last 50 years have been invented solely for one purpose. I mean, there, I would say there's very few that are invented to improve our nutrition or to make our bodies happy. They're really there to improve the bottom line of the food industry. And when you realize that these chemicals have been invented to make food companies more money and not make us healthier, you kind of wonder, why do I want to be part of that experiment? Why do I want to eat those chemicals? What are they doing for my body? And in many cases, these chemicals haven't been reviewed by the FDA. There's actually over 3,000 that haven't been reviewed by the FDA. Um, there's over 10,000 chemicals allowed in our food. And the chemicals themselves aren't being third-party tested. You know, we have this underlying assumption that we have this big body of government that's overlooking for our health. And they aren't. They don't have the resources to look at every single chemical or to, to look at an independent study of the chemical. They actually rely on the food companies themselves to do this work. And, and that, unfortunately, puts us in a position where our food companies are governed by making money, and, and that's their priority. And you know, I'll just give you a really good example of what, how awful a company can get. <laughs> Um, you know, a, a great example is Kellogg's. You know, Kellogg's is a company that makes cereal for children. I mean, basically, that's their, that's their bread and butter. And, you know, they own a lot of other uh, subsidiaries and companies as well, but they're making cereal for children. And in 2015, because of various campaigns that we help lead at foodbabe.com and with the Food Babe Army and all of the people out there that shared petitions, et cetera, we were able to get Kellogg's to say they were going to remove artificial food dyes. And they made the announcement in 2015 because there was a big push for people becoming aware of the fact that artificial food dyes are linked to hyperactivity in children. They can cause immune disorders. They also are linked to um, allergies and skin rashes and other problems within um, children and adults. And this is something that is a no-no ingredient that does not make it into my kitchen, you know, and people are like, well, what do you do when it's the holidays or, you know, you want to make something festive or pink or whatever, you know, I try to find a real food ingredient. And a great example of that actually is in Food Babe Kitchen, I made my daughter's third birthday cake this January or last January. And um, she wanted a strawberry cake. And for me, when I think of strawberry cake, I think of the Duncan Hines box version of the strawberry cake with the uh, cream cheese icing that's already pre-made. And it's so pink and it just reminds you of strawberry shortcake. You know, it's just, it's, that's what you make when you make a strawberry cake, right? And that's what I did when I was little and when I was growing up. But if you look at the ingredients of that stuff, it is horrendous. It's all dead, Right. And um, not to mention, it used to have trans fats. It still has artificial coloring and all sorts of additives that actually still promote trans fats in it, like monodiglycerides and some of the other tricks that the food industry uses today to continue to add trans fats to their, to their food so that they preserve longer on the shelf. And uh, I decided, I said, okay, I'm going to figure out how to make an amazing strawberry cake that's pink 
um, without using artificial food dyes. And I took a whole bag of freeze dried strawberries that just one ingredient, organic freeze dried strawberries and put pulverize them in my spice blender and then mix that into, you know, organic cream cheese, organic grass fed butter and organic sugar and just whip that all up. And it was this beautiful, bright pink. And it's actually the, the cover photo of the book, uh, of, the, of the chapter in Food Babe Kitchen for desserts because the cake just turned out so beautiful. And, um, and everyone loved it at her party. And it was um, something that I'm so proud to recreate and show people that they don't have to rely on these artificial food dyes. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, going back to Kellogg's is Kellogg's figured out a way to remove these artificial food dyes by using real food ingredients overseas because in, in Europe and other countries, they require a warning label that says may cause adverse effects on activity and attention in children if a product has artificial food dyes. And so um, Kellogg said, you know, instead of putting this warning label on our product, we'll remove them for the people overseas. But they didn't do that for their own American customers. I mean, they're an American company, right? They're headquartered in Battlefield, Michigan. And um, this hypocrisy, this unethical behavior from a company has to stop. Um, the fact that they know their products could be harming children and continue to produce them with these artificial food dyes, especially after they made the commitment in 2015 to remove them, which today is 2020. They said they would do it by 2018. They didn't do it and instead did the opposite, which is even worse. Um, they decided to create new cereals that are directly, again, targeting children, the youngest of the young children with a baby shark cereal. And then just this year, in the midst of a pandemic, when the emphasis on this world should be trying to get your immune system strong and healthy and protective, uh, they decide to come out with a whole line of waffles. You know, they're the company that also make Eggos, make a whole new line of waffles dr directly targeting children that have unicorn and mermaids on them and birthday cake. And, you know, when, my, when I was working on a graphic that I wanted to share about this, the fact that they come out with these waffles that have artificial food dyes directly targeting children, I was working on the graphic and my daughter comes running over and sits in my lap at my desk and she sees the graphic and she says, mommy, mm, unicorn waffles, those look good. And she's three years old. She is three years old. And just seeing this on my screen, I mean, this is the power of their marketing. Um, but that's just one example of a food company that I believe is very unethical, that has no moral compass, that their only goal is to make money. And, and can, which, I, can, I, can I jump in with a quick question, yeah. if possible? You know, zooming out for a second, uh, I'd love to get your opinion on this. You know, as people who are listening to this podcast and, you know, feel enraged by that story. And even in the midst of a pandemic year where, you know, so many people are upset that the government is really talking about how to really improve your immune system. How much of a balance of it is individual family responsibility of education and how much of it is we should be asking our government to protect us? Just get curious to get your, your thoughts on that. I mean, I think there's gotta be, I, I, again, I, I, based on my research of government policies, and, and people have at, always asked me this question. They've said, Bonnie, why don't your campaigns ever go after the government? Why aren't you lobbying the leaders in Washington to make these changes so that every food company has to make these changes? Well, there are people that are really skilled at doing that. There's a lot of nonprofit organizations like the NRDC and um, the Environmental Working Group and others that, you know, have teams of people that can do this in Washington, right? And I think, you know, that's one way of activism. But I think the fastest way to get change, and this is, uh, you know, uh, evident in the amount of change that we've been, been able to create by targeting companies directly. You know, we've gotten Kraft to remove artificial food dyes, Papa John's to completely rehaul their entire menu and remove majority of their preservatives. Same with Panera Bread, got 
Chipotle to be transparent about their ingredients and then even take it a step further and remove all GMOs, getting um, one of the largest fast food chains to, to completely go antibiotic free, um, Chick-fil-A, getting the beer manufacturers, Anheuser-Busch and Miller Coors for the first time in history to release what's actually in their drinks. Um, Starbucks to remove uh, very controversial caramel coloring linked to cancer from all of their drinks in the pumpkin spice latte. You know, all of these, and this is just a handful, I and mean, there's many more examples of campaigns or, or um, petitions that we've led at foodbabe.com that have been carried by people like you, Drew, who have shared them, and other people that not only care about their own health, but they care enough about making change in the world you know, when you target these companies directly and, and relate it back to the consumer, you know, when I, for example, Starbucks is a great example because, you know, when it's pumpkin spice latte season, like right now, you know, everyone gets so excited about it. You know, people are like, oh, I want a pumpkin spice latte. This is going to be so delicious. And then when you let people know what's actually in it, in which, by the way, Starbucks wouldn't tell me what's in it. I have, I have to convince a barista behind the counter to show me the different packages of liquids and chemicals that they were mixing to make the pumpkin spice latte, take pictures, and then publish that on foodbabe.com and, and reveal what was actually in the pumpkin spice latte. And, you know, I found very alarming ingredients, you know, one of those being caramel color level four, which is made with ammonia, is um, considered a carcinogen according to the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And they were adding this caramel coloring to a, a product that comes in an opaque cup. I mean, it had no reason to be there, right? You're not even seeing the pumpkin spice latte. You're just tasting it when it's in that opaque white cup. And so, you know, when I revealed this, I didn't even have to start a petition. It went so viral because people wanted to tell people what was in their drinks that they were so excited about. And, you know, the media obviously grabbed a hold of it. It was on all these different news stations. And eventually Starbucks knew that they had to remove it. And not only did they remove it, they actually added real pumpkin <laughs> to, <laughs> to the pumpkin spice latte, which I thought was hilarious because, you know, the media kind of made a big deal of the fact that it that had no pumpkin in it. And that wasn't even my gripe, but it was just funny that they added that in. Um, and, you know, when, when you talk about personal responsibility, um, you know, we, you know, you and I, this is our, you know, we love researching food, right? We love researching health. We love figuring out, you know, how to tweak what we're eating to make us feel the best, right? And we're a very unique subset of the entire world. And I just think about all of my friends who were busy doing other work and how the food companies themselves have figured out whether it's through ingredients that make us addicted to their products or through marketing that is, dis is, uh, is disguised as news or disguised as a new study. Um, and, and they use all of these tactics, and I, I talk a lot about all these tactics in Feeding You Lies, my second book um, that was out last year. You know, those tactics keep us kind of under their spell. And unless you know how to untangle uh, that web of deceit that the food industry plays on us, which I teach you how to do that in Feeding You Lies, um, you're not going to be aware that you're being duped. And, and so I think absolutely people have to have the personal responsibility to take back control of their health. And, and, you know, my message has been, especially during this pandemic is, you know, no one's going to be looking out for you. You have to look out for yourself. You know, if <laughs> I think I shared, you know, if someone watched the first presidential debate, if you think the government's going to take care of us now, you you know, you're, you're in trouble, right? And so it's, it's really important for us to understand that we need to figure out how to eat. We need to figure out how to become our own nutritionist. This isn't rocket science. You know, the only people that have made food complicated in the last 50 or so years have been the food scientists themselves, right? 
It's, it's not rocket science. And it's one of the reasons why I open up Food Babe Kitchen with this really intuitive way to ask yourself these three basic questions every time you sit down to eat. And if you answer these three questions, you will not only become more knowledgeable about the food you're eating, you will eat better and you will feel better, feel really good. And, um, and I think this is education that, um, and I'll go through those three questions in just a second, but I think this is education that isn't taught in, you know, school, you know, my, my daughter just started school. And so I just think about the curriculum that she's learning and, you know, I'm so thankful for the school that she's at because they don't, for the snack time, it has to be a fruit or a vegetable. It can't be anything packaged. And like, that's like my holy grail. I think that's, that's amazing that the school is doing that, but that is very, uh, that is very uh, alternative to the way that our children are raised. And we just don't have the education uh, built into the education system about our food. And so I think it's, it's, you know, that's kind of my thing that I want to work on next is like how to educate kids at a very young age to say no to artificial food dyes on their own, right? How to, how to get them to say, ah, I don't know about that. Have you read the ingredients on that package, right? Like how do we make that cool as washing your hands or, you know, uh, going to the potty or whatever else you have to learn, you know, as a toddler, as you grow up. And, you know, I've had to, I've been in those circumstances where, you know, I've been at a birthday party and the mom whispers over to me because obviously my friends know who I am and what I do. And they say, Hey, I, I don't think you're going to want Harley to eat that cake because my kids went to town on the food coloring this morning to make the Spider-Man cake. And I, I'm pretty sure you're not going to want her to eat that. And it was very kind of the mom to, to tell me that in advance so I could come up with a, a good plan of why Harley shouldn't eat this cake and what I can convince her to do instead, you know? And, and that's what I did is, you know, when it was cake time and everyone saying happy birthday, um, I just whispered to Harley really quick. I said, Hey, you know, um, they made that with a bunch of artificial food dyes. That's why it's bright blue and red. You know, would you like to try something else as your dessert? You know, they've got a chocolate chip cookie over here. They've got a popsicle over here. And it was like a all fruit popsicle. And she chose the popsicle. So it was just this beautiful moment of trusting her with the information to make a better decision. I didn't want to not include her in dessert or I didn't want her to feel like she didn't get anything when all the kids were eating cake. And a lot of the kids just kind of looked at the cake because it was so <laughs> bright blue and didn't even eat it because it was, it was so different looking. But but it was, you know, this moment of I've been, since she was just so teeny tiny, teaching her about junk food when we were, you know, like she was like 10 months old and she had come with me to a, a business trip and we were flying from New York. And I just remember she was in the, you know, uh, the gift shop just at the airport, just trying to pass time and crawling around the floor and looking at different things. And, you know, they have all those candy displays right there at the bottom um, towards, you know, where kids could just grab it or whatever. And she was kind of grabbing it and playing with some of the packages, the M&M packages and the Snicker packages and all that kind of stuff. And I took that moment when she was even 10 months old to say, Hey, Harley, this is junk food candy. This is stuff like we'll never, mommy will never buy or never eat. <laughs> and, you know, and so don't even ask me, <laughs> it's like, you know, at 10 and months you do, old, you so do your you know, you do your best to educate kids. You know, I don't, I, my household, you know, you're talking about like two Indian immigrant parents. Um, my parents were pretty like into like just home food and making that. And then, you know, you get to high school and they know like they can't control you and they never pressured us. So I never rebelled. Right. You see that sometimes with like kids who get pressure or parents can be more militant and the kids will naturally rebel. You want to go explore stuff. You want to do things, but that being said, if you're raised with this stuff, this background, when you get to a place where you're in college and all your friends are getting sick and you remember what your mom used to tell you about not eating so much sugar, you know, during like flu season and being more mindful of X, Y, and Z and you feel good and they feel like crap, that's when these things start to stick in and become a way of life rather than something that we're doing just because our parents, you know, wanted us to do it. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, my parents had zero rules when it came to food. So 
it was, you know, I was a free for all at my house. I mean, every single one of my baby two teeth were like pulled. I'm, I'm convinced. I mean, they or had a really bad cavity in them. You know, I ate so much candy under the sun. I would hide it behind the couch and just eat it all day long when they weren't looking. And, um, and so it, it you know, it's funny because I asked my mom, I'm like, you know, mom, I didn't see you like policing me or like seeing that I was eating this candy. How come you didn't stop me? She's like, she's like, Bonnie, I was trying to get your aunt and your uncle immigrated to the United States. And then I constantly had this, this slew of relatives coming to stay with us. And I was in the kitchen trying to cook for them. I was busy. You know? <laughs> she's like, I parked a full-time job. I did not have time for this. <laughs> and and I was like, okay, I, I get it. I get it, you know? And, um, and I, you know, she, she obviously, you know, regrets uh, some of the things that she did. And she says she feels bad about it. But I also see that, you know, they came here with nothing. They're just trying to make it happen and then try to get their fa You know, my dad was the first one out of his entire, or both, you know, my mom and him's entire family line to be here in the United States. So, and now every single one of my family members is here. So it's, um, and, and if I could, if I could jump in on one, one point that you made there, going back to something you said earlier, it's actually why it's so important to put this pressure on these companies. Not only that you said it's the fastest way to make change, but if we really care about the health of this country, the folks that are suffering the most, even in the context of this pandemic, are the most disenfranchised groups that have two, three jobs, right? At least when it comes to, let's say, the death rates of COVID that, you know, a lot of people in the media are worried about. Well, if we really want to pay attention to them, we got to set up the infrastructure around them to be a no-brainer for making healthier choices. Because when you're working two, three jobs, you're so worried to just put food on the table. Let's say, you know, in your mom's instance, she had your dad's help. But if somebody's a single mother, which is one of the highest predictors of poverty, lifelong poverty is whether or not somebody's a single mother, right? That is such a big, you know, factor. So they're just trying their hardest. They're trying to do their best. And then their kid is running to, you know, the, the mini mart that's next door to the house, not even a real grocery store. This is why it's so important to fight because at the end of the day, somebody who's listening who thinks like, well, what does this really have to do? You know, let's say somebody who's more feeling like, well, family should just get educated and this should just be their thing. They should teach their, some people don't even have the room to teach. And then yeah. ultimately we all pay for the healthcare or the society continues in a lockdown as we're dealing with right now in and out of state lockdowns because people can't shake, you know, the whole COVID thing because actually those groups are the sickest, um, most disenfranchised groups in the actual world. Yeah. And, you know, and I think that's one of the reasons why people say, well, Bonnie, you don't eat cereal. Why are you campaigning for healthier cereal? Or Bonnie, you don't eat Subway anymore. Why did you care that they had a yoga mat chemical in their food that was banned all over the globe and linked to asthma? You know, why did you do these things? And it's because I used to eat all this stuff, you know, and I remember how I felt. And if I didn't have my awakening, I may still be in that situation. And I know there are so many other people right now walking around like I used to in a zombie like state, not knowing how good they can feel when they take back control of their kitchen and their health and get back to their, you know, cooking real food and really understanding the ingredients. And, you know, uh, I wanted to share those three questions that you asked, yeah, please. you know, when you sit down for a meal and if, if everyone did this, um, and this is something that doesn't cost money and could have a tremendous impact on your health. And it's literally asking yourself when you sit down for a meal, what are the ingredients? That's the first question. You have to know what you're eating. If you don't know what you're eating, if you read the back of the package, you don't understand an ingredient, go look that up. Thankfully, you know, there's plenty of resources you can use online to, to look up these ingredients. Just Googling them by themselves will tell you what they are. And then you'll, you'll kind of realize that, oh, in this piece of bread that I'm eating, there's this ingredient called um, monodiglycerides. What, well, what is that doing there? You know, what does that mean? Is that helping me as an individual get healthier or 
know, why am I eating this, you know, chemical really? And you'll find out that monodiglycerides, especially if you use the Food Babe website, is a, uh, a type of emulsifying ingredient that they use to preserve uh, bread-like and cracker-like products that um, it replaces the use of trans fats and still has small reoccurring um, amounts of trans fats in them. And when you realize that trans fats was linked to 20,000 heart attacks a year and 7,000 deaths, it's definitely not an ingredient you want to continue to buy. And so you'd say, well, maybe at the next meal, I'm not going to buy that bread because now I know that ingredient. And then the second question you ask is, are these ingredients nutritious? And in the case of monodiglycerides, if you find out what it is, you'll realize very quickly, you don't have to be a nutritionist to, to know whether that's nutritious or not. You know, you'll realize that's not a nutritious ingredient. And then, and then the third question is, where do these ingredients come from? You know, are they coming from a chemical factory? Are they coming from a factory farm? You know, um, and, and when you start to ask yourself those questions, you not only become really super smart about what you're eating on a normal basis, but you start to make some fundamental changes that will improve your health. Because once you know, you can't unlearn it, right? Like once you know, you can't unlearn it. And it's like, it's kind of like when, when I took on Chick-fil-A and I remember the story and this is, this is such a, 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 a you know, just uh, the epitome of like where we are when we think about food right now as a collective nation. You know, you think about calories or fat grams or protein grams, and, and that's how you kind of choose food. But it, it never needs to be about that. It always has to be about the ingredients. And, you know, one day my husband went to work, and this is, you know, a while back. He was going to work, and um, a coworker of his um, ate Chick Fil A almost every day. And he's like, you know, I'm not eating Chick Fil A. I know what's in that. It's no, no, I'm not going to eat that. And she came back with the pamphlet from Chick Fil A one day and showed my husband, um, "Hey, look at look at these calories. Look, it's only under 400 calories. Look at all the protein I'm eating. You know, all the stuff." And he goes, "Well, that's not what's important. Look at the other side." And they had the ingredients actually listed on that pamphlet. At Chick Fil A, and he brought that home to show me because he couldn't believe how many ingredients. It was close to a hundred ingredients. One of the first ingredients was MSG, and I took a picture of those ingredients and posted it on my personal Facebook page. And I had just started Food Babe at the time; it, it was very early on. I, you know, probably had like a hundred readers or something. So I just posted this on my personal Facebook page, it's just my close knit group of friends. And I got every single type of comment under the sun because Chick-fil-A is like in the South here, it's like, you know, you don't mess with Chick-fil-A because it's delicious. I mean, even my mouth is watering right now thinking about it, even though I haven't had it in over 10 years because of the MSG that they use that tricks your brain to remember the flavor and hijacks your taste buds. So... So that's how they get you hooked, right? And, um, and so when I, when I showed the list of almost 100 ingredients, I expected outrage from people, but it had things like TBHQ, which actually messes with your immune system and um, causes allergic uh, reactions and triggers in your body. It had, you know, that MSG ingredient, it had dimethyl polysiloxane in it, which is um, a silly putty ingredient that the FDA allows to have in our food as an anti-foaming agent and can be preserved with formaldehyde. It had a ton of other chemicals in it that just don't belong in your body. And I was like, no wonder I felt so bad every time I was eating Chick-fil-A. So I, sh I share these ingredients and, and there's this one comment from my childhood friend that I love to death. Her name's Alyssa. Hey, Alyssa, <laughs> if you're listening. And I grew up with her and she wrote, a hundred ingredients of deliciousness. She's like, oh, look at that, you know. And I just said to myself, she just has no idea what these chemicals mean or what they're doing to her body. And so I need to break it down for her. And I need to break it down for everybody because they just don't understand. Right? And it starts and, and with people, the premise that they're believing that these companies have the best interest. Of course, they're regulated. Of course, the FDA is looking at it. Of course, all these things are happening. You know, so what? I know it's not as healthy as a piece of broccoli, but it's all safe. That's the belief yeah. that a lot of people have. Right. They're like, who cares? These, these chemicals <clears throat> are approved for use, right? They're generally regarded as safe, right? And, um, and I said, you know what? She just doesn't know. And so I said, okay, 
and it was a Saturday and I said, you know what, I'm going to spend some time looking up each one of these ingredients and I'm going to discuss it and I'm going to write a big blog post about it. And it was one of my first blog posts that went viral, like outside of my hundred <laughs> readers or so. And, and because people just couldn't believe they'd never seen the ingredients in Chick-fil-A ever published like that and broken down and, and talked about in terms of what was, you know, actually in it. And, um, and it was an awakening moment for a lot of people. And when we talk about how, you know, people sometimes don't want to see what they're eating and they, they look the other way. Um, I think it's okay sometimes, but, but, but not in this day and age when our food has been adulterated by these chemicals and they are really having an impact on our bodies. And, you know, we're just part of this large science experiment. And, you know, just to tell people what happened as a result of that viral blog post, Chick-fil-A eventually invited me to their headquarters. And that's when I started consulting with them. And, and when they made the commitment to remove, uh, they asked me, you know, what, what's your number one thing that is a problem with our food, right? Like, what's your number one thing? And I was like, the way your chickens are raised on antibiotics. Because, you know, when I met uh, the former general of the U.S. Army, uh, Wesley Clark. I had an opportunity to meet him one day and I asked him, you know, I ask any politician I meet anytime, I ask them about what's their stance on food, what's your biggest food issue, what, what do you want to change about food? So when I met him, I asked him, I said, you know, what do you think is the biggest risk um, in terms of food to the nation, you know, and he said, antibiotics in the production of our meat because it could wipe out the human race. And, you know, as a general of the U S army, whose job is to protect the world and protect I mean, the United States, right. From foreign invaders, from enemies, whatever, um, from, you know, all, all kinds of threats, you know, for him to say that was very impactful and, you know, what I was thinking at the time. And, you know, and before meeting him, I would have said something like, you know, MSG or, you know, what, you know, or the artificial food dyes or whatever. But I was like, no, it's the production of your meat. It's, we've got to remove the use of an, uh, antibiotics. And, uh, and I put that number one and the, t the head chicken supplier was in the, the head chicken guy at Chick-fil-A was in the room, the guy who buys all the supply for chicken. He's like, listen, this, this can't happen. This is, you know, uh, there's just not enough supply. You know, we're not a Chipotle. Um, and I said to him, I said, you, it's not that you have to go find the supply. You have to make the change within. You have to convince your suppliers that you're buying from now that this is the way of the future and that this is how they're going to survive in this day and age when people become aware of how their food is being produced. And as these issues continue to cause things like superbugs um, where people cannot be treated with antibiotics and starts to really affect human health. Um, and not only did they listen, but they did it and they've already completed it. And it was just an amazing thing to be a part of and witness. And it was all because, you know, of my friend Alyssa yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and her saying, you know, a hundred ingredients of deliciousness. And I was like, no, 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 you don't know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in every campaign that I, I've started on Food Babe has, has started that way with like a personal story of something that just motivated me and gave me the passion to just spend all day researching and, and, and going and following through with these companies to make sure they understand what the public wants. And, um, and it's, you know, this is, you know, the reason I do this work is because I just, I just don't want anyone to feel like I used to. And, you know, the night that I took, you know, that I came down with my, my appendicitis, I actually had eaten a Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich. I'm not saying that it caused it, but it's just, it's just, you know, things happen for a reason. So. And, and, and I think that just to piggyback on that story, another component, you know, for people who are like, okay, cool. I don't eat Chick-fil-A. Like I'm pretty healthy. I think a thing that they would find valuable inside the book is that as you go and break down in those first 50 or so pages in the book, you break down all ingredients, you know, you break down uh, beef, fish, uh, you know, eggs, poultry, for example, we're talking about Chick-fil-A and you talk about examples of poor choices, misleading labels, right? The ways that the food companies have sort of engineered words to kind of trick people 
and then better choices. So I'm going to just touch on a couple of these piggyback off of Chick-fil-A since we're talking about that on the category of eggs. Um, and under misleading labels, you have cage-free vegetarian diet, natural or naturally raised, no hormones and farm fresh. Why, why are those examples of misleading labels? Well, first of all, hormones usually are not given to chickens at all. So um, whenever you see non-hormonal chicken, that's, that's usually um, just marketing. Um, the second thing is cage-free doesn't mean that they have room to eat pasture or they have room to actually run around. They could be in a hen house, very packed in like a cage. Um, and have a small opening where they can leave and come back, but uh, their environment still can be a very um, uh, less uh, appealing environment that actually promotes disease in these chickens. And the reason why they have to administer antibiotics, you know, the, you know in order for chickens to survive in these um, crowded facilities is, you know, they have to give them antibiotics so that they um, every time they have, you know, uh, an infection from, you know, just living in really horrid environment and being fed food that they're not supposed to be fed, which is, you know, usually uh, GMO corn and soy, which is the majority of, you know, people think that, you know, humans eat the majority of GMO corn and soy that's produced in the, around the world and in the United States. It's actually animals that feed off of that. And, um, and then we eat those animals and that's, you know, really how we get sick. So, um, so all of those labels are, are kind of meaningless because, you know, a vegetarian fed, um, chicken who's producing eggs, is still eating GMO corn and soy. So what you want to look for is an organic label, number one. So, you know, the food that the, um, the chickens are eating is organic, so it's not doused with Roundup, which is linked to cancer and implicated in hundreds of lawsuits now, and um, juries are awarding their plaintiffs like billions of dollars um, uh, against uh, Monsanto and Bayer um, because their Roundup um, has caused cancer. And uh, so you want to avoid that. Um, so that's why you want to eat organic eggs. But then you want to go a step further and look for pasture raised. And so this is when the chickens are able to run around on a pasture, eat bugs and be around the dirt and have freedom to roam and eat grass and um, eat all the things they're supposed to be eating. Um, you know, they may have some supplemental feed as well that's organic um, to help them be raised, but it's definitely a much better option than, um, than conventional. And so I take the reader through every single category of what you buy at the grocery store, every single grocery aisle, and, um, and I share what's the best um, version of what you can buy and then how to avoid these misleading labels. Give us a uh... Just jump to the recipes for a second, right? Think about sort of the current context of the world, what's coming up in terms of Thanksgiving, holidays, you know, that sort of thing. People trying to make those things special at a time where it can be difficult to make it special depending on where people live. You might not always be able to see your family, There's certain people are at risk. What are a couple of the recipes that really stand out, especially with this holiday uh, season coming up? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one thing I do want to mention is, you know, I, I wasn't planning to talk about Chick-fil-A in this way, but actually I have a homemade Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich recipe in oh, the yeah. book. That's um, amazing. So that's a great one to make for your family when you all get together because, um, you know, it'll show them that they can have a uh, somewhat, uh, it's, it's a baked instead of fried chicken sandwich, but um, it tastes just the same and it's delicious and, and, and really, really good, especially if you use some good bread and, oh, you know. That's, that's I'll have to uh, trust you on that. Never had chicken leg. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but, you know, some of my favorite, re well, first of all, the recipes in this book um, are so special to me because this is stuff that I'm making in my own kitchen. This is, this is not going to take you all day because I'm not a trained chef. This is, you know, again, I learned to cook in my, in my mid-20s. 
And um, I don't like to spend all day in the kitchen. I'd rather be working on my activism work or, or, or creating new products at Truvani or, um, or writing books, you know. And so, uh, you know, when, when it came to writing this cookbook, I was like, well, I'm just going to include the recipes that I'm making all the time that I love. And, and that's really what it is. And I think, you know, some of the, the really special recipes actually came from my mother, she submitted four different recipes in this book. Um, basically what she makes for me and my daughter and my husband every single week, she makes these amazing kale pronthies where she takes kale from her garden, puts it in a blender and blends it with a little bit of water and then mix it, mixes it in with the dough and makes kale pronthies. And my daughter just eats that with grass fed butter. And sometimes she, she, she dips it in her doll, uh, which is also a recipe in the book, um, which is, if for, for folks that don't know what dal is, it's just lentils, um, like spiced lentils, curried lentils, really, really good and very comforting. And then there's a curried uh, gobi or cauliflower recipe um, and her famous carrot halva, which is a recipe made out of carrots. And, um, and those are such uh, like just special recipes to me because now – I'm going to have them in my cookbook forever to always go back and make, and I won't have to, you know, eventually your parents are going to die. And so, you know, I think about this with my mother-in-law who died, you know, she was one of the most amazing cooks and I wasn't really into cooking like I was, or even the food babe at the time of knowing her. And so I didn't spend a lot of time trying to like study her recipes or study what she was doing in the kitchen. I just enjoyed her cooking and gosh, if I could go back and, and figure that out and get all of her recipes and, and that's why it was so special for me to include my mother's recipes in this book so that her legacy kind of lives on and Harley can make it for her daughter or her son one day and, you know, and just keep, 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 keep on going. So, um, so that was really cool. But, um, in terms of the holidays coming up, there's an appetizer in there for kale and artichoke dip. That is just a hit with anyone that comes over. Um, and it's, it's a great way to get a ton of vegetables in, in an appetizer fashion. So when the main course comes, like you don't feel like, uh, you've eaten, you know, I don't know. I feel like, you know, an appetizer menu, a lot of times at different restaurants and stuff are always like the fried, like, you know, kind of unhealthy stuff that they recommend um, at the beginning of the meal, unless you get a salad. So um, it's just one of those, those dishes that everyone loves. Also, um, these little goji berry drops that my best friend actually contributed and her mom contributed to the book. Um, they are um, just three simple ingredients, actually four simple ingredients. Um, Roasted almonds, um, a good um, type of quality organic chocolate, um, goji berries, which are incredible for eyesight, have um, some of the highest antioxidants of any berry, um, are amazing for fertility, all sorts of amazing health benefits for that, for your immune system, just incredible amounts of vitamin C, and then um, sea salt. And all you do is melt chocolate and you pour in some almonds and those goji berries and then you just drop them on a little piece of wax paper and then sprinkle it with sea salt and you let them harden. You can put them in the fridge to harden and they are like to die for. I mean, it, it, it the, the chewy nature of the goji berries inside this little chocolate treat is like, it almost tastes like caramel. It's just, there, it's just incredible. And they're so easy to make and everyone just needs to have them in their kitchen, <laughs> but just warning, cause you might eat more than you should. Cause they're just, they're too good. They're too good. But I also have another thing in here, which I would love for people to make for their Dorito loving friends. I know everyone who's listening here has a friend that still eats Doritos. Okay. Just be honest. You may even still eat Doritos. I know you don't, Drew, but you know, the person <laughs> listening. Um, but I have a recipe for homemade Doritos. And the best part about these Doritos is when they come out of the oven, they're hot. And there is nothing better than a hot chip. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I think that the other reason that the message in the book is important and your work continued is that as wellness becomes a bigger and bigger category of food, there's going to be, you know, we, we get a lot of flack for big companies like Kraft and Kellogg's and other stuff, 
But also in the wellness space, there's companies that are making what seem like better for you products, but actually have their own issues that might be there. And often that could be just being aware of like the total amount of sugar, you know, which is uh, something that me and Dr. Mark Hyman are obviously very aware of. So just being so aware of all ingredients because you can do, be duped by any kind of marketing and the wellness world, you know, is growing. So naturally it's going to attract as any industry does, it's going to attract more people who are trying to create things. You see it all the time with something being paleo, but then having like 12 grams of sugar, you know, inside of there or all sorts of aspects. So I think it's a fantastic book for um, anybody to, uh, to pick up. Um, tell us a little bit more about uh, the other stuff that you have going on in your world. Yeah, you know, we have some big things happening actually at Truvani. Um, we uh, are going into, I don't know if I should announce this. I feel like I should just announce it. We are just going into another whole realm next year. And so just expect some really cool things happening. You know, um, when I started Truvani in 2017, it was like mid 2017, I, that was when our first product shipped. It was a um, organic turmeric supplement. And, you know, I created this product because my turmeric supplement had been um, bought by a giant chemical corporation and they changed the ingredients. And I said, you know, this is something that um, is not okay with me and I want to take supplements that have the least amount of unnecessary ingredients. And I couldn't find a brand that did that. Um, and it's one of the reasons why you see on Truvani supplements, all of them have an uncoated um, tablet. And a lot of people don't realize this, but the coating on a lot of these supplements are, you know, synthetic or they're undesirable ingredients. I mean, there's some companies doing it right, but I just felt like creating a product that when you take a supplement, you're getting the most, uh, whatever you're taking, you're getting the, the most quality ingredients in your body every single time. And this is one of the reasons why we created our protein powder, which we just came out with two new flavors. We have a vanilla, we have a chocolate, we have a banana cinnamon and a chocolate peanut butter. Both are our chocolate peanut butter and banana cinnamon only have seven ingredients and, th and it has no natural flavors. And if people ask me, you know, Hey, why don't you include natural flavors? It sounds so fine. It's just like, you see this on all sorts of organic products and you know, what's the big deal. And, um, unfortunately, because of all the research I've done into flavoring, I see how they're created and why these companies have created these flavors to sell is because they create um, a t an unnatural taste actually in the laboratory. Yes, the, the, the main component of uh, the flavor may be coming from something in nature, but the, um, the end result after they've done the chemical composition and the, the manipulation of these ingredients ends up being something very unnatural. It actually creates the one millionth best part of a taste that they're trying to create. And so if you're constantly getting your, your taste buds hijacked by that taste, you're not going to know what real food tastes like, things that come from nature. And I don't want to be part of that game. And so, and I also don't want any of the products I create at Truvani to be part of that game. I never want to trick someone into buying more protein powder than they should, right? Like, the protein powder should be there to help supplement um, their diet and also provide them a fast food option when real food isn't available because, you know, you know, I'm all about real food. And so I wanted to create a product, you know, when it came to our protein powder, I didn't want to see any gums. I didn't want to see any natural flavors. I didn't want to see any artificial sweeteners or sweeteners that create that artificial sweet taste um, kind of like stevia in, in the product. And so I wanted to use the least amount uh, and, and the best versions of every single ingredient. And so that's why you'll find that our protein powder has the least amount of ingredients and the majority of protein powders out there that are ready to drink um, with just water and tastes amazing. Um, and, you know, our, our next realm of products are coming out and we've just got some really exciting things in the works. And I'm really excited because um, I've been able to be the guinea pig on these products this year. Um, and uh, it's, I just can't wait to show the whole lifestyle cycle of creating these products and what I've learned. And, and I think um, 
the best thing that's happened to me with starting Truvani has made me an even better activist and a, and a better consumer uh, of goods because I've learned the tricks that the food companies use in order to make more money and get economies of scale behind the scenes. And these are a lot of things that I have to push back on as my role in Truvani, which is ingredients and product. I'm always the one that says, no, we can't move forward with a product because of a certain ingredient or a practice that the supplier is using. And it's not a fun position to be in, especially when you have an amazing team of people that spend all day, you know, coming up with the specs or, you know, creating the, the labels and the, the um, going through the legal checks and doing all the things that are involved with a product company behind the scenes. And you're the one that, you know, has to pull the plug on it because you find out, like, for example, one of the Omega supplements we were trying to create last year, we wanted to create and it, they wanted to use a non-organic sunflower oil as the carrier. And the non-organic sunflower oil as a carrier was using hexane um, as an extractant to extract that sunflower oil. And that just wasn't an option for me. And, you know, people not understanding that process, that hexane is a carcinogenic material that can still end up in someone's food. It's something that the FDA doesn't regulate in our food even today. Um, it was, you know, when I have to explain this to, you know, when you're starting a company, you're hiring all sorts of people that don't have the background and the knowledge of these chemicals. And so you have to explain why you have to push back on these specific things. And these are questions that everyone knows to ask. And and so when you pick a Truvani product, you know, it, it makes me so happy and proud that I am behind every single ingredient looking at these different standards and, and, and going behind the scenes with these suppliers to make sure they're producing even a small ingredient that ends up in a product as a carrier is produced in the right way. We eventually got... Um, uh, a better source of that sunflower oil. And we did a organic sunflower oil that wasn't produced with hexane to, to be that carrier in the, in the plant Omega um, product that we have. But it took uh, probably eight months to secure that. And, you know, time is money when you're, when you're starting a company and you're doing this, but this is something that you wouldn't see in one of the big major supplement brands out there. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't go through this rigor but this is what we're doing at Truvani and why I'm so proud to, to have this company. Yeah, and I love what you guys are up to. We'll make sure we link to that in the show notes. Bonnie, I know you have a hard stop coming up. So I want to say thank you for coming back on the podcast, sharing the stories, the why behind what you do and kind of teaching us all how we can be, uh, you know, it really starts in our kitchen. These campaigns are fantastic. And yes, people can participate on that. And in addition to that, we have to take care of our own kitchen and uh, you've written the cookbook to help people do that. Food Bake Kitchen, it's out. We'll have the link in the show notes and uh, the link to the website. Vani, thank you so much for being back on the Broken Brain Podcast. I love this conversation with you, Drew. Thank you so much. I hope to see you in person soon so I can give you a hug. <laughs> I know. We're, we're overdue. We're overdue. <laughs>